NBS Happening Now. This March, in commemoration of the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2021, we deliberate on the value of water and environment resources in transforming our economy and livelihoods through a 371-kilometer walk. From Kampala through Mpiji, Mitiana, Mubende, Chegegwa, Chenjojo, Fort Porto, to the riverbanks of River Nyamwamba in Kasese, we walk for water. We walk for the environment. We walk for climate change. We walk for public health. We walk for social economic transformation. The Uganda Water and Environment Week Walk is proudly sponsored by On the need to end the unnecessary single-use plastic scourge that is threatening the region, a forest dialogue was held to celebrate the International Day of Forests under the theme, Forest Restoration, a Path to Recovery and Well-Being. The event heightened the need for addressing issues related to deforestation, forest restoration and environmental degradation. Regional activities were held by all the six regional structures of Ministry of Water and Environment in partnership with other stakeholders highlighting how they are dealing with key water and environment pressing issues in their regions. On the 21st of March, the Speaker of Parliament also launched the annual tree planting campaign 2021 where the Ministry of Water and Environment, in collaboration with Uganda Breweries Limited, organized the 2021 edition of the Running Out of Trees. A campaign aiming at planting 40 million trees in one day with a symbolic run of 330 kilometers relay from Kampala to Gulu City. This fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week has several parallel sessions running from Monday the 22nd to Friday the 26th of March 2021 for you to attend. Okay, so there are week-long activities arranged until the weekend of the 26th, which is Friday this week, and. Uh, but even ahead of those events, a lot has been happening, as you've seen in the video that we just saw. So just for, for us to all keep in mind, we are live on two TV stations, Uganda Broadcasting Corporation and also NBS TV. So I'll also ask that the people who are constantly moving around keep that in mind as uh, that picture will be on the screen. This is a three-hour online televised event. A lot of the people that will be participating have joined us online. Um, if you're sharing key highlights from today and throughout the week, we're using a hashtag, UWEWK21. Um, and also now to give us more information about the event, but also the stage for what the rest of our conversation will be, I'm going to invite the chairperson of the organizing committee of this event, Dr. Kalist Tindimguya. And I'm going to just read a brief profile about him as he makes his way to the podium uh, opposite mine. Dr. Kalist is a commissioner and head of the Department of Water Resources Planning and Regulation in the Ministry of Water and Environment, with overall responsibility for ensuring sustainable and equitable utilization and protection of water resources for Uganda. He has been working with the Ministry of Water and Environment in Uganda for 30 years now. He is one of the brains behind the Water Resources Institute and the Uganda Water and Environment Week. He has been the chair of the Technical Committee of the Uganda Water and Environment Week since 2018. Dr. Kalis, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I honor Minister of Water and Environment representing the Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda, who is our guest of honor. The Honor Minister of Lands, Environment, and Burundi Wansi in the Uganda Kingdom. The UN Resident Coordinator for Uganda. The UNDP Resident Representative the Food and Agriculture Organization Resident Representative, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, 
our development partners, colleagues, welcome to the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week 2021. We have a number of activities lined up, and we shall be discussing the theme Water and Environment Security for Sustainable Social Economic Development of Uganda. We do hope that you are ready to walk this journey with us. We started about a month ago with pre-event activities, and we are continuing with a packed week, which is starting today afternoon, and we shall close on Friday, 26 March, from 2 to 4 p.m. We have a number of presentations that will be made, and will be starting today, with a keynote presentation on the overall theme we are happy to present to you a number of panelists, experts in various fields that are going to be sharing with us their perspectives and views on how water and environment security can contribute to the sustainable development of Uganda. We shall also have, be having a number of young people that will be making appeals to us on how we can improve the way we do things. For your information, ladies and gentlemen, we have been having a walk running for 371 kilometers from Kampala to Kasese near River Nyamwamba. And we shall also be showing you the gallant Ugandans that have been part of this walk. So as we continue, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank the substantive chair, Dr. Florence Grace Adong, She's having another capacity, that's why I'm speaking on behalf of the chair, but I've been chairing the technical committee. We have designed a, a very interesting program, and we do hope that those of you who will not be able to be with us here physically will participate online. As we speak now, we have a number of people participating online. But this, one, this event wouldn't have been as it is now without the hard work of the National Organizing Committee members. I would like to request the National Organizing Committee members stand up wherever you are so that you can be appreciated and I would want to request that we give them a big clap. Stand up, National Organizing Committee members. You have done a good job, but we are not yet there. We shall evaluate ourselves on Friday when we will be closing this event. We have also been supported by a number of partners and I would like to request that we show the partners on screen so that the guest of honor and the dignitaries attending this event can know the scope of support we have received. Can we have a short screen showing the various partners? I will not mention them, but you can see the screen is full. That's an indication that we have had a lot of interest in this event, and we are happy that you have supported us to make things happen. So all of these partners you see on the screen, some of them have been mentioned, we shall not mention you by name because you are many, but we would like to thank you on behalf of the organizing committee for supporting us and for making UWEC 2021 a success. Thank you very much. Let's give them a big clap. <laughs> Probably one of uh, guest of honor, maybe before I end, let, let's invite the workers. The, the team which has been part of the 371 work. Can I request the, 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 the main worker, the lead worker, Geoffrey Ayeni and your team, if you can move forward. I know a number of them are still there, but they have been supported by many people. You can imagine walking 371 on foot, and you are walking for water, environment. You see how they walked? So walking for water, let's give them a big clap. We had one lady as part of the workers. So this is the only lady that was walking with the gentleman, and we want to thank you. We have shown that ladies can do everything men can do. They have been supported by a number of people. Along the way, they have met various people. The, the Minister of Land, the Environment, and Buganda actually met them at the first stop. Along the way, they met by district officials, and when reached Fort Porto, they were met by the Toro Kingdom. So again, we want to thank the workers for continuously supporting us, to raise awareness about the importance of water and environment resources. With those, I want to welcome you once again and wish you an enjoyable Water and Environment Week where we feel that we shall benefit from your interaction and presence. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Dr. Callist. They, they're constantly telling us that the future is young and also that the future is female. So I want to recognize two young girls, females, who I would like to invite to come to the podium. They're passionate about the environment. They're, they're the only two young females here, young girls from school, who are passionate about the environment and who are going to say something to us about that. So Valerie and Vanessa, please come to the podium. Okay, this is Valerie and Vanessa is, is joining her. So uh, Valerie, you can introduce yourself to the people that are watching. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Valerie Naruima. I'm in grade five. I'm 12 years old. I'm a Youth Go Green child. And I'm happy that Youth Go Green is mentoring us through this week. Okay, Vanessa, do you want to introduce yourself? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vanessa Namakula. I'm 14 years old. I'm in senior one. I'm a youth go green, and I'm happy that it's mentoring us. So Valerie and Vanessa are from Youth Go Green, and they're here to give us a poem in relation to what we are here to talk about today. You may proceed. My poem is going to be based on water resources. Mama Uganda, the real power of Africa, lakes and rivers with fresh waters of Nalu Valley and Chira, providing fresh fish second to none world over, making Uganda a magnet of tourists. I love you, Mama Uganda. Mama Uganda, you are crying because your children are your own enemy, stabbing you from left right and center in the name of the economy draining all your waters suffocating all your waters now the importer are dying mysteriously all swamps replaced by rice skins mama uganda weep no more we the young generation need to see you smile again creating a conducive environment recycling and reusing propaganda dumping. Everyone has a part to play. Let's all go green. God bless go green. God bless Uganda. Oh, Uganda, the pearl of Africa, our motherland, evergreen, full of potential to feed and lead us all into prosperity, and harmony. Uganda, with good climate, forests, lakes and rivers, abundant rain, mountains and valleys, oh, what a beauty. Fellow citizens, why are you selfish, draining swamps every other day, planting rice, deforestation, yet deforestation causes desertification, desertification causes deforestation environmental disaster. People in power, save the environment. Think about the wetlands. Are you exalting or exhausting? Are you making it better or bitter? Investors or wasters? Many questions, few answers. The ball is in your hands. All leaders, are you managers or damagers? Fellow children, die every day and night. Yet we have a right to live in a green and clean environment. No, no, enough is enough. You and I have a duty to protect our environment and make Uganda a better place for us to live in. Long live youth go green. Long live Uganda for God and my country. I think we can do better than that. How many young people do we have? coming up to boldly speak about the environment. Just one quick question for both of you. Why are you passionate about the environment? I'm passionate about the environment because I believe that Uganda has, is full of potential. We have very many tourist attractions. 
we have the mansion falls, but I believe that if our environment is kept clean, we shall it will boost in our economy and we also love nature. And we all want to live in a beautiful and clean environment. Vanessa? Well, I do love nature a lot. I love mountains, the valleys, the lakes, the rivers. And if we make Uganda a better place, if we make Uganda a green country, a green and clean environment, then we have a potential to be a better country than we are right now. Thank you very much, Valerie and Vanessa. You can take your seats. We just wanted to be sure that nobody put the words in your head and clearly you, you speak from the heart about the environment. Um, let's keep with the program. And I am now going to invite the UN resident coordinator, Ms. Rosa Malango, to come and speak to us. But even as she comes, I'll just give us a brief about um, her profile. Ms. Rosa Malango has been at the United Nations, uh, has been the UN resident coordinator and designated official for security in Uganda since 2016. She is the highest ranked representative of the UN in Uganda. She ensures overall team leadership of the UN system in Uganda. She ensures the interlinkage and mutual reinforcement of humanitarian development, peace and security and human rights through implementation of the United Nations Development Assistance Framework. 2016-2020 in support of the National Development Plan, Vision 2040, and the 2030 Agenda. I'll stop there, and I will invite her to take the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. I really wanted to um, begin by conveying my heartfelt congratulations to the ministry. Um, this is the first time I'm in this room, and um, it's a really uh, impressive. So congratulations to the ministry for having this here. I will now read uh, my remarks on behalf of the United Nations system on the occasion of the beginning of Uganda's Water Week. Um, the Honorable Minister for Water and Environment, representing the Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda, um, other Honorable Ministers present and following online, Honorable Members of Parliament, local government officials, representatives of civil society and the private sector, members of the Youth SDG Coalition, youth climate leaders from Uganda, colleagues from the UN system, in particular the UNDP and FAO country representatives, the media, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the United Nations system, I am delighted to participate in this year's Water and Environment Week. Congratulations for a great plan to raise awareness about three UN days, namely the International Day of Forest, which is today, the World Water Day, which is tomorrow, and the World Meteorological Day, which is on the 23rd of March. I wish to thank the Ministry of Water and the Environment for this idea and for inviting me to give an address at this function on topics which are close to the heart of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and the African values of Ubuntu Mulamu, which I share. I am here in the context of the 2030 Agenda which all United Nations member states, including Uganda, adopted as a common vision using inclusive partnerships to achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals with a common end to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Climate change, forest, and water are at the epicenter of our journey towards shared prosperity. We have an individual and collective responsibility to take action now. Ladies and gentlemen, today is International Day of Forest, celebrated under the theme Forest Restoration, A Path to Recovery and Well-Being. 
forests provide health benefits for everyone, such as fresh air, nutritious foods, clean water, and space for family recreation. In developed countries, up to 25% of all medicinal drugs are plant-based. In developing countries, this rises to as high as 80%. According to the 2020 Water and Environment Sector Performance Report, in Uganda, forest coverage has reduced from 24% in 1990 to 12.4% in 2020. This means that in another 20 years, Uganda could stop being the pearl of Africa due to deforestation. The question is, what are we going to do today to ensure the protection of our forests? And allow me to highlight a few. Budongo Forest, Bugoma Forest, Zoka Forest, and Mabira Forest. Concerted action by cultural leaders, the private sector, and the government is key because failure to act will lead to more natural disasters, devastation, and poverty. So tomorrow, the 22nd of March, is International Water Day under the theme valuing water. Now we know water is critical for our households, food, culture, for health, education, economic development, and the integrity of our natural environment. If we do not understand water's true relevance, we will miss the opportunity to protect and teach our children to safeguard this critical resource. Water can exist without us, but we cannot exist without water. As the UN, we share Uganda's aspiration to improve the quality of life at the household level, to move parishes to a money economy, and to enhance both production and social protection. But for this to be done, it has to be done in a sustainable manner. We must apply the concept of environmental protection to development, especially in light of the growing population and rapid urbanization. We must carefully implement both our approaches and technologies for agriculture, industrialization, services, ICT, tourism, and other sectors. We must pursue green industrialization, green agribusiness. We must use renewable energy, and we must promote environmental-friendly healthcare and tourism. We must invest in community participation and disaster preparedness, and we must support heritage tourism, leading the way to showcase not just the cultural kingdoms and their sites, but also local values around conservation. Ladies and gentlemen, our new global data shows that more than 1.4 billion people, including over 450 million children, live in areas of high or extremely high vulnerability to water. This means that globally, one in five children do not have enough water to meet their daily needs. Climate change is making this worse. When disasters hit, they destroy or contaminate entire water services, increasing the risk of diseases like cholera and typhoid, to which children in Uganda are particularly vulnerable. With the advent of COVID-19, access to water and sanitation have become essential to mitigate the spread of this disease. Ensuring affordable and smart solutions for household, parishes, and districts across this nation is key if we are to achieve sustainable development. A holistic approach will call on us to value water sources, water infrastructure, water services, water as an input for production and socioeconomic activity, as well as water as part of our cultural and spiritual heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, on 23rd March, we shall commemorate the World Meteorological Day under the theme, the ocean, our climate, and weather. Oceans cover some 70% of the Earth's surface, making them a major driver of the world's weather and climate change. 
Oceans are also major drivers of the global economy, carrying more than 90% of the world trade and sustaining 40% of the human race living within 100 kilometers of the coast. Uganda, as I like to call it, a land-linked country, with most of its goods coming from the coast of Mombasa and Dar es Salaam, is part of the East African community and accesses water that way. But I want you to imagine for a moment if we were to work on cross-border value chains. This would enable Ugandan farmers and entrepreneurs to establish targeted links with partners in Kenya and Tanzania, which will enable East Africa to be in a robust position to benefit from the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Imagine wheat and maize grown and preserved with high-quality post-harvest services in Uganda, packed in Kenya, sold to Nigeria, South Africa, Singapore, Australia, the EU, and even the United States. But before I conclude, I wish to highlight that the COVID-19 pandemic requires us to change the way we do business, how we commemorate events, how we teach our children, and how we share knowledge. In this context, this year, we must stay focused, keeping our distance, wearing masks at all times in public places, washing our hands frequently with soap and clean water, or disinfecting them as we mark this Water Week. This is an opportunity for each one of us to pay tribute to human commitment and ingenuity with those around us. So I encourage you to post an encouraging message, to organize a webinar, or to go on a radio talk show. Together, let's highlight the importance of preservation. We cannot improve livelihoods or achieve prosperity without determining how we will protect Mother Nature. Allow me to share some statistics to inspire our action. A, around half of the global GDP depends on nature. B, our oceans and forests sustain billions of people and provide green jobs. 86 million green jobs come from the forest alone. C, 4 billion people rely primarily on natural medicines. And D, natural climate solutions, such as afforestation and using greenery to cool our new cities and buildings can provide up to one third of the emissions reductions we need to meet the Paris Agreement goals. Honorable Minister, representing the Right Honorable Prime Minister, allow me to appreciate the working relationship between the government, the parliament, the United Nations, development partners, civil society, and private sector in supporting climate change advocacy and natural resources agenda in this country. Through the UN Sustainable Development Cooperation Framework, under the second strategic priority, we commit to supporting the attainment of shared prosperity in a healthy environment. We will focus on reducing environmental degradation and the adverse effects of climate change, while also improving the utilization of natural resources for sustainable economic growth. This is part of our contribution as the United Nations to supporting Uganda to attain the SDGs, the National Vision 2040, and the NDP 3. As I conclude and reiterate the United Nations commitment to a healthy world that will support health, peace, and prosperity for generations to come, let me end with a quote from Nelson Mandela. I quote, we can change the world and make it a better place. It is in your hands to make a difference, end quote. Together, let's make a difference, preserve our planet for the next generation, and ensure that no one is left behind as the Pearl of Africa achieves inclusive prosperity. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Rosa Malong Malango, UN Resident Coordinator in Uganda. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Can we put up our hands much better than we did for Rosa? <clears throat> May I request that you also clap for my colleague, Josephine Karunji. Um, I'm not a stranger in the house, but I'm going to be assisting Josephine, and together we shall ensure that this program runs smoothly. My name is Charles Odongtho, and I'm a journalist, but also a lawyer, but I do mostly media work. Thank you so much. Now that we have heard from the UN body, may we put our hands and welcome the Honorable Sam Cheptoris, the Minister in charge of Water and Environment, who is also representing the Prime Minister of Uganda. Honorable Minister, sir, you're most welcome to take to the podium. Um, I see the Minister or oh, the Minister has uh, requested um, someone else to take up some of the tasks. I'll request Madam, that uh, since I don't have your details here, you help the room by starting with an introduction of yourself and then we can move forward. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, uh, our moderator. I'm Dr. Florence Grace Adongo. I'm the Director for Water Resources Management and the Chair of the National Organizing Committee for the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2021. I'm here to represent my minister. As a technical person, you should be ready for anything. So. I am ready to represent the Minister of Water and Environment, Honorable Sam Cheptoris, uh, and I would like to read his message verbatim. The Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda, represented by the Minister of Water and Environment, Honorable Sam Cheptoris, Honorable Ministers, Members of Parliament, the UN Resident Coordinator, the UNDP Resident Representative, representatives of the development partners, cultural leaders, private sector and civil society organizations, representatives of other stakeholders, senior government officials in your respective capacities, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I wish to take this opportunity to welcome you to the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week being held on this day, 21st of March, 2021. In a special way, I wish to welcome our guest of honor, Mr. Sam Cheptoris, Minister of Water and Environment, who is representing the Right Honorable Prime Minister of the Republic of Uganda for coming to officiate over this important function. Thank you for honoring our invitation, and uh, we are very appreciative of your time spent, which you could have otherwise have been doing something uh, else. Your officiating at this event, the Right Honorable Prime Minister, is a demonstration of the importance the government attaches to water and environment issues. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, this is the first time that such an event is being organized in Uganda. As a ministry, we have learned from the experiences of the last three Water and Environment Week events where, during the organization, and we continue to improve as we learn by doing. We shall therefore continue to address anything that may not have been well done since we are very committed 
to the Water and Environment Week as an important annual event in the ministry. I wish to take this opportunity to thank the various organizations, agencies, and partners that have worked tirelessly in this ministry, with this ministry to ensure that this event takes place uh, successfully. Your contributions are very much appreciated. In a special way, I wish to thank and congratulate the team lead for the Uganda Workers Association that worked from the ministry here to promote and sensitize the public on environment, climate change, public health, and water, and they covered a distance of 371 kilometers up to the banks of River Nyamwamba in Kasese. The team has been collaborating with the, this ministry to raise awareness on these important subject matters. And we want to enlist our support to the people of Uganda as we collectively move the advance the importance of sustainable management of water and environment resources. You are our heroes and you have made us very proud once again. Several prevent activities, of course, have been, done, have been taking place in different parts of the country until this morning, as you have seen on the video. We therefore want to thank all those who have participated in one way or another in making all these prevent activities very successful. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme for the fourth Water Environment Week is Water and Environment Security for Socioeconomic Transformation of Uganda. As you have heard and read, this event is being celebrated under four sub-themes. One, valuing water and environment resources for socioeconomic transformation of Uganda. Two, water and environment in a creative economy. C, managing water and environment shocks. And D, water and environment security for smart urban growth. Looking at the setup of the Water and Environment Week 2021, it is clear that it is intrinsically linked to National Development Plan 3, which focuses on enhancing value addition in key growth opportunities, reducing environmental degradation and adverse effects of climate change, as well as improving utilization of natural resources for sustainable economic growth and livelihood security. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, water and environment resources are key strategic resources that are very vital for sustaining our life, promoting development, and maintaining the environment. We need to remember that there is no activity that can be undertaken where water and environment resources are not involved. At either its primary stage as primary input or as a secondary in input, or indirectly by regulating our climate. For example, access to clean and safe water and improved sanitation facilities and practices are a prerequisite to a healthy population, and therefore we have a direct impact on the quality of life and productivity of the population. We are all aware that currently, the COVID-19 pandemic prevention, number one, is to use safe water for washing your hands and observing sanitation and hygiene, among others. This, therefore, raises the importance of water and environment to another higher level. Besides domestic water supply, water is also vital for livestock, industries, hydropower generation, agriculture, marine transport, fisheries, waste discharge, tourism, and environment conservation, among others. Water and environment, therefore, significantly contribute to the national socioeconomic development, although we most of the time take it for granted. The Ministry of Water and Environment conducted a study a few years ago on the economic contribution of water and environment to the economy. The study clearly demonstrated 
that the importance of water and environment resources to Uganda is well pronounced as long as we would want to pursue our developmental aspirations. The study noted that substantial investment in environmental management and water resources are required to triple Uganda's water delivery levels, an essential contribution to country's economy to meet its Vision 2040 growth targets. Therefore, as Uganda seeks to industrialize and meet its national development goals, water and environment management will be critical to ensure steady growth of the manufacturing, agricultural, and other key service sectors. As we have already been informed, the Water Environment Week 2021 comprised of a number of activities which I have earlier on mentioned. And from the previous speaker, we have just had the commemoration of the International Days for Forest, Water, and Meteorology. I wish to thank the United Nations Coordinator for accepting to join us and deliver the key messages for these three international days. As always, we expect that this event will provide an opportunity to all of you, add value to your knowledge, our stakeholders. We also exchange views and experiences and practices that are key in moving water and environment resources management and development forward. I wish therefore to call upon you to participate actively in various activities and benefit from a wealth of knowledge and experience present here. I want to assure you that this ministry's commitment to move forward the deliberations and recommendations of the Water and Environment Week 2021 is paramount and we shall be, be using all the information to revolutionize the management and development of these resources and focus more to, towards its contribution to socioeconomic transformation of Uganda. I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming and staying online for this important opening function. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is now my singular honor and privilege to invite the Right Honorable Prime Minister of Uganda, represented by the Minister of Water and Environment, to deliver his speech and formally open the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, in waiting. <laughs> the Prime Minister was supposed to be here with us to deliver a speech. Unfortunately, he sent his uh, apologies that he is uh, engaged in an equally important activity. So I'm here to read his speech. Honorable Minister of Water and Environment, Honorable Minister of Lands, Water and the Environment of Uganda Kingdom, Honorable Ministers of State, Members of Parliament online, the United Nations Resident Coordinator, UNDP Resident Representative, representatives of the various development partners, representatives of private sector and the civil society organizations, representatives of other stakeholders, government officials, all Ugandans watching and listening to this event, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to take this opportunity to address you during the opening of the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week. I wish to congratulate 
the Ministry of Water and Environment and it is various partners for organizing the first Uganda Water and Environment Week and for bringing together all the key stakeholders to dialogue on issues affecting the sector and the Uganda in general. I'm happy to note that you have maintained these annual celebrations as a way of providing an interface between sector actors and the other stakeholders for knowledge exchange, dialoguing, and the learnings on issues related to sustainable development and the management of water and the environment resources. Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, water and environment resources support life Ladies and gentlemen, as you are aware, water and environment resources support life and social economic activities. These resources are central to agriculture, the Ministry of Uganda's economy, from which 85% of the population derives their incomes and their livelihoods. Provision of adequate water for agriculture will spur transformation of the economy through increased productivity for both livestock and the crops. Water is also required as an indispensable input in agro-industrialization. It must therefore be available in adequate quantities and the corresponding quality at the right time and right place in order to contribute to the achievement of the development goal of increased household incomes and improved quality of life of the population. Environment and natural resources are, however, under increasing pressure despite their importance in ensuring water and environment security and a social economic growth. For example, the forest cover has declined from 24% of Uganda's total land area in 1990 to 12.4% currently. This is majorly attributed to biomass fuel, biomass, biomass fuel, cooking, combustion, with other auxiliary drivers, such as expansion of agricultural land, sporadic urbanization, and income poverty, industrialization and inadequate incentives for private plantation forests. About 90% of Ugandans use firewood and a charcoal for cooking. Other challenges include encroachment, illegal harvesting, and titling. Similarly, the national wetlands coverage as a percentage of the total land area declined from 15.6% in 1994 to 8.9% currently. It is estimated that Uganda loses 846 square kilometers of, of these wetlands annually. The major cause of wetland degradation are poor farming practices, and unplanned urbanization and the settlements, excessive water abstraction, income poverty, poor intra and intersector coordination with regards to continued issues of land titles in wetlands, sand mining and industrialization of wealth with some of the demarcated business industrial parks located in wetlands. Well-managed wetlands, river banks, and the forests make communities resilient to extreme weather events and the disasters, such as floods, prolonged drought, and the incidences of water scarcity. 
while there are a number of ongoing efforts by the various ministries and the agencies of government and the other stakeholders to restore wetlands, river banks, and the forests, a lot needs to be done as follows. There is need to secure the boundaries of wetlands, river banks, and the forests, and also gazette, and strictly protect those that provide critical functions that avert climate change impacts. There is need to protect and restore water catchments, especially those that have been degraded. There is a need to remove pressure from wetlands, river banks, and the forests by creating alternative livelihoods that are economically viable. Ladies and gentlemen, Uganda has also, over the last one year, been experiencing rising water levels of major water bodies and intensive rainfall since September 2019. These are having very big flooding in several parts of the country due to prolonged and the impacts on property, infrastructure, and the people's lives. There's a, this is due to increased settlements and developments in flood plains, poor agricultural practices and deforestation. These have made the soils loose and the steep slopes bare and allowed water to move very fast to valleys immediately after rains. The above factors have all combined to worsen the flooding problem. Government is currently implementing measures to manage the perennial occurrence of floods in and around the country. This includes, among others, protection of water catchments and the general environment, regular maintenance of water bodies and the rivers so that they perform their waste water storage and the conveyance function, construction of water, reservoirs, demarcation, and the protection of lake shores, river banks, and the wetlands to limit encroachment by settlements, agricultural activities, and the other development, and the strengthening of enforcement of the water and environmental laws at all levels. Ladies and gentlemen, another big problem is the plastics we see around. This has become the most dominant waste in the country, both on land and the inner water bodies. More than 600 tons of plastic is disposed, disposed of each day. The country has a large number of inland freshwater bodies which are being suffocated by plastic litter. This is in addition to the pollution caused on land in the drainage systems in towns, dump sites, and the parks. The country does recognizes the threat and the dangers posed by waste and the particular plastic litter and the associated, associated pollution, and has put in place a number of measures to address the problem as follows. We enacted the 2019 environmental law, which bans carrier bags that are under 30 microns. Government has imposed producer extended responsibility as part of polluter pays principle. This will ensure that producers of materials with potential to pollute will have the duty to follow the management of their product through its life cycle. The law has brought on board a cross-section of other actors to implement the provision of the law on plastic pollution. Government has also imposed 
mandatory condition to all plastic manufacturers to establish recycling plants and ensure that they follow their plastic material and bring it back for recycling. This is the precondition for licensing any plastic manufacturing enterprise. Specific emphasis has been put on nation nationwide multi sector multimedia critical environmental details and campaigns to empower citizens to follow the right waste management hierarchy. I want to thank the education sector, which has taken the lead in slapping a total ban on plastic carrier bags in all our education institutions. Awareness creation in schools is being done through the different environment education initiatives. The plastic recycling sector is being improved in order to reduce the amount of plastic waste entering the environment. I wish therefore to call upon all Ugandans to support all efforts to address the problem of plastic pollution. Ladies and gentlemen, what are the environment resources don't recognize administrative boundaries. These resources are shared with other countries by various local governments and by various people. Thus, their rational and equip equitable development and the management is key to growth of the country. The varying uses of water are interlinked and require sustainable exploitation and the management to ensure that there is adequate water of the right quality and the quantity for both production and domestic use even during the dry seasons. Thus, considering that water and environment resources are at the core of sustainable development and are critical for social economic development, healthy ecosystems, and for human survival, these resources will be critical in the achievement of the NDP3 goal and the targets. I'm therefore happy to note that the theme of the fourth Uganda Water Environment Week is water environment security for social economic transformation of Uganda. I also note that this event is celebrated under four sub-themes, namely A, valuing wa water and environment resources for socio-economic transformation of Uganda, B, water and environment in a creative economy, C, managing water and environment shocks, and D, water and environment security for smart urban growth. This is a befitting theme and a sub theme for the fourth water for the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week, more so at the time when the country is failing, facing challenges caused by COVID nineteen, rising water levels, flooding and a job loss. I therefore request all the participants of the fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week to critically discuss how water and the secu environment security can be ensured to enable the country address the current challenges and to contribute to social economic transformation through inclusive growth, employment, wealth creation in line with the NDP3 goal. I therefore have, have no doubt the outcome of this Uganda Water and Environment Week will make significant contributions to enabling Uganda achieve the National Development Plan 3 goals and uh, targets. I wish to recognize the organizations and development partners that have continued to support the Minister of Water and the Environment to deliver water and environment resources to the people 
of Uganda. On behalf of the government of Uganda, I wish to thank you for this support and request you to continue providing such support so that this critical sector of government can perform its key functions of sustainable development and the management of water and environment resources for the benefits of Ugandans. I wish all of you very fruitful deliberations during this week. I wish to formally declare the Fourth Uganda Water and Environment Week formally open for God and my country. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister deserves a bigger hand clap. Um, we are now going into, to move into the keynote speech, and we have uh, a professor all the way from uh, um, Colorado, and he's ready. Allow me now to um, introduce Professor Ken Stresbeck. Professor Ken is a leading researcher and practitioner at the nexus of engineering, environmental, and economic systems related to civil infrastructure, with a focus on water, food, and energy systems and climate change adaptation. He investigates the role of climate change and infrastructure development on economic growth and poverty reduction. Stresbeck is a research scientist at the MIT Joint Program on the Science and Policy of Global Change. He has spent 40 years as a researcher and practitioner. He is joining us uh, through Zoom and uh, Professor, you're most welcome, and you're going to give us a keynote address in 25 minutes, or if you like, under 25, on water and environment security for social economic transformation of Uganda. Professor, you're most welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are you able to hear me in Kampala? Very clearly, Professor. Yes, if the host could open my screen sharing, I will share my slides with you. It is um, with great pleasure that I join you today, very humbly that I can be with you, and I want to um, thank you for this invitation. And as we prepare our slides, I would like to um, thank all of the previous speakers, and as I open to um, acknowledge the, um, the Prime Minister and his representatives who are here today, the Minister of Water and all of the other distinguished uh, speakers. And I am extremely honored that we would have such wonderful um, young Ugandans with us today. As we know, the future of Uganda is in its youth and to hear such wonderful um, poetry from them about the topic today is is outstanding. So if the host could um, release so I can share my screen, they're not allowing participant screen sharing. So um, we need to get host right. Yes. Professor, that preparation is being made. Okay, good. So while, while that's beginning, I will, I will start a little bit, and then you can uh, see that um, this morning, I am, I am, my heart is with you in Uganda while I am here in Colorado, 10,000 kilometers away. But I want to tell you that I tried to make a part of Uganda with me this morning. Ah, oh, wonderful. We can now share. Okay, so can you see our opening slide? 
Yes, we can see. Okay. So as I said, um, um, because I couldn't be with you, I am here partially in that I am drinking my coffee here at five in the morning, and that coffee comes all the way from Mount Elgon. So every morning I'm able to have part of you as I prepare this work. And also, I made my own Rolex for breakfast this morning. So as much as I can with you, I'm trying to be there today. So let's see if we can, uh, we can share, because Dr. Kalis said there would be lunch, but he said it was too hard to ship by DHL to me. So we will be a part of you today. Um, what I wanted to talk today about was to, to link two things. What do we know about um, economics and water and environment? And then also what's going on with the theme of this con con um, conference and workshop? And can we bring some information directly to it to hopefully start it off in the right direction and uh, bring up some questions and issues? that have been um, going on in Uganda. So the first thing here, so we want to address that the goal of NDP3 is industrialization. We see that, successful industrialization of the economy. So this is really important because as we'll see a little bit later, that is generally the path to increase incomes um, and move labor from low paid agriculture to better industrial um, development. However, there is a threat when we work with industrialization um, and, and over the past. And there is a famous Harvard economist called Kutznes, and he developed a curve um, which has been adopted by environmental economists and development economists that show that um, there has been traditionally this path as you move through economic development, which is basically income per capita. So if we assume um, that dashed line on the left-hand side is where Uganda is now, and NDP3 wants to get us to the dashed line on the right, historically, all the Western countries and many of those have gone on this path that the more you develop, the more you degrade your environment through pollution, destroying resources like wetlands and, and forests, which we've heard quite a bit about. And um, my distinguished colleague from uh, UNDP, we're going to address some of those issues of forestry as well today, um, not just water as we move forward. So as we have this threat, um, what I wanna come is to bring a warning. What, what is the, the warning that we have is, let's go look at another country, which is Vietnam. And what's the cautionary tale here? Is if we look on this plot at the bottom, we see that it rapidly grew and past the middle income threshold, which we know is a goal of the government of Uganda. But as it went along, it had good resources. Um, but if we look again, what we see is from a recent study that we were just involved with is that this growth is 5% less than it could have been had they not trashed the environment or polluted. So while we think this path that we just showed in that curve is something that would be um, beneficial for the government. As we've looked at this, here is the, the, these results. We did an analysis like we did in Uganda, and untreated water on health is leading to a 3%, 3.5% 3 decrease in GDP alone, and water stress from not taking into account good water resource management is another 1.2. So almost all of this 6% impact on GDP loss was due to water management and pollution. And so how can, how can we go forward? Um, is it possible to, to grow? Well, there is a theory that's out there that we're at a crisis. And so there's a famous um, quote by President John F. Kennedy, who quoted the, the Chinese symbol of crisis, which says, when you're at a crisis, you, you come and you bring danger and there's opportunity at that point. And what, what has happened is um, back then when, when Kennedy was speaking, um, America's knowledge of Chinese culture, I think was not as, as good as it is now. And what they've said is that opportunity is more, is a bad um, translation of the second character. It's more a turning point. And so one could view a turning point as an opportunity as well. So, we're facing a crisis. 
Uganda wants to grow. The past, every other country in the world has seen this um, growth, but at the, at the cost of the environment. Is it possible that there's a new way forward? And what that is, is this um, red line. Can Uganda go from um, pre-industrial to post-industrial, from to middle income without seeing this rapid degradation of the environment? And what I argue is that it can. And so development and environmental economists call this um, activity tunneling through the Kutznitz curve. And can we tunnel through, or we have heard so much about COVID, one of the things we keep hearing is flattening the curve. If it, if can we do something to keep us from having this peak? And I argue we can. And that's what we want to talk about today as we go through the four themes that you've talked about. Um, the first one is, as we look at this, where is water and environment? This is a list of projects from um, NDP2. Nowhere in these uh, priority projects is anything related to water and environment. But as was mentioned in the previous um, speech, um, we were fortunate with industrial economics to be part of the activity um, by the former minister who asked, what is the impact of investment in water environment on Uganda's growth? And the good news is that like we found in Vietnam, if we invest in, the 20, in Uganda 2040 to enhance water supply, wetlands, forests, and catchment management, we can increase GDP by 2040 by 9%. How is this possible? This 9% is broken up into these different parts. By water and sanitation alone, that brings us about 3% providing water for livestock, what we call water for production. That brings another 10%. But what's important is as we, to go along with my colleague from UNDP, forest protection brings you on the order of 25% of that benefit. Um, and then flood risk mitigation through wetlands and others brings an important part. So what we're able to see is in Uganda, these are numbers for Uganda, if we invest and take another step forward and do not, um, to, or if we tunnel through or bend the curve, people usually think that's gonna come as a cost. They think protecting the environment, um, sustainability will slow down growth. And we're showing it's just the opposite that will it'll increase growth. And so how can Uganda do things differently? Uganda can chart a different path. Our studies have shown that this stewardship will help it. But what we need to do is integrate water and environmental investment plans within a framework and tools for sustainable growth. So it's requiring all the ministries to work together and to come together at cabinet to see that as we allocate budgets for investment and as their investment to protect the environment as we grow, we don't have to do it in spite of it. The next part that we've talked about is the theme today is the creative economy. And how does that fit with that? Well, one of the things that, as you look at the definition is, is using um, creativity, using um, high tech, and that is something really important in water infrastructure, making smart cities, making smart systems that will use the advantage of um, technology. And an example of that would be flood forecasting. What can we do by using satellite data, weather forecasts, et cetera? And, and does that help in our growth? Well, what we found is, here's just one study of this, that a study was done for Europe that if we use flood awareness systems, that the benefits are 400 to one for investments in smart technologies for flood investment, for flood protection over um, pouring concrete or building other things. Now, this is, really high, I bet it's even lower, but any, even if it was 100 to one, that would be a fantastic system. So as we study in some of the other work we've done in smart infrastructure, um, we, we need to come not only with just um, hardware or hard structures, but also management, adaption, and, and um, other exciting uh, technology. So we can bring the created economy into a partnership with the future development of water and um, environmental protection. Um, those together 
will be very um, economically beneficial. As we move to our next theme here, um, water managing shocks. Now, this is something we because uh, we need to understand a little bit why shocks are so detrimental to economies. And so one of the things here is we usually use GDP as a measure of the economy, and that's true. And on, on the right-hand side here is a little um, schematic which shows how is GDP produced. GDP is produced through what we call capital. And there's a new um, approach out there amongst economists called inclusive wealth, that a country's wealth is its capital, and there are three factors to its capital. The natural capital, which we heard about before, the beautiful um, pearl of Africa, the rainfall, the sunshine, um, the land that's there in Uganda. How can we use it? Then there is the produced capital, the buildings, the roads, the reservoirs, the hydro plants that we've, we've developed. And then there is the so important human capital, the education that goes into the expertise that, that we see. Now, um, with everyone in the room, the economy and just to be to wake everybody up this afternoon here's to me is the output of an economy is a function of l which is labor and k which is capital so the amount of capital you have um here will affect your output and so what we have to do is we want to have sustainable uh development Sustainable development in the new inclusive wealth world is that we keep growing this, this bound of capital and we don't deplete it. Now, the issue is, if we go ahead and look at this, shocks, what they do is they impact the capital. And, and so, from the ability of an economy to produce. And so, we, it is very important to protect our capital. So, here's an example, unfortunately, with my name, um, Cyclone Kenneth that just hit Southern um, Africa. It damaged roads and bridges, which is that that produced capital. And teams couldn't even reach the, the flood victim. But this is what more, the total economic damage to Mozambique alone was $1 billion, 10% of the total domestic product, the most extensive natural disaster. Most of that was destroying capital, bridges, um, farmlands, schools, um, homes. So next year, rather than building new capital, they were replacing the old capital and it slows economic growth. And work we've done in Southern Africa, um, this is the biggest threat of climate change, is not drought, but floods, which destroy. So the World Bank estimated what we found that over the next 20 years, control in two forms, mainly na nature-based solutions of protecting of wetlands, being careful how ten to one on our investments um, in terms of flood protection, because what we're doing is protecting our capital. So as we move forward to this last theme of urban growth. We've had the privilege of working together with, um, with GIZ and the ministry and Dr. Kalis um, and the um, steering committee to look at what was a project known um, as WASEP, the Water Security Action and Investment Plan for Uganda. And as we looked at that, one of the things we see here is that increased investment to a secure future for area will lead to in, um, GDP over the next um, 20 years. And that's an order of $195 per capita by 2040. And as we look at that, part of that is not just going to stay in the capital region, but it's going to go throughout um, all of Uganda through the linkages of economy. So these investments in um, developing that further goes through all of these different sectors as we look at that. And so we, we talk about this and say, well, what is the importance of that? You know, is this investment good? Because as we've seen, 
capital um, for investment. This returns of other important projects, production projects during its initial phase is about 1.6 um, percent increase of GDP. At its peak, 7.2 in its last year, about one. Climate change impacts are proposed to be about 1.5 to 2 percent impact. Malaria alone is about a minus one. But if we look at investing in water secure um, Greater Kampala, we get on the order of 4 percent increase per, per year over the next 20 years. So investment in water security, investment in environmental protection is not a drag on the economy, slowing down growth and slowing down developing income, but it, what it is, it is actually enhancing that. And as we've seen in Vietnam and many other places throughout the world, so Vietnam, we're looking back at data about what has happened. With our work, we're using a model of what could be in the future. And they're aligning together to say, we need to worry about um, the environment as we move forward. Activity that took place in Stockholm, 13 of the world's leading economists, four former chief economists of the World Bank and Nobel laureates were together and they came out with some core principles and it's called the Stockholm Statement. And they said, be careful, GDP growth in it is not an end in itself. Well, why it's important and it measures things, what we want to do is development has to be inclusive, including all and bringing up everyone. But number three addresses this point. They have said environmental sustainability is a requirement, not an option. And these are not people from the Ministry of Water and Environment. These are chief economists sitting in cabinet in, in the prime minister level looking at, at global development. So that number three, and I emphasize not an option there. As we, what else have, have they shared with, shared with us? They said, as NDP3 says, we need a structure of change in, in countries. We have to have this transformational change because agriculture is low productivity in terms of wages. If we want to increase the welfare of the citizens of Uganda to give them, uh, drive them out of poverty, give them more resources, we have to move to things like industrialization. We have to move to higher productive services. But again, it has to be done sustainably and not at the cost of the environment. And then finally, um, as we've looked at this, all successful development has entailed government playing an important role. We, we all know PPP, public-private partnership, is crucial to development. But in terms of infrastructure and institutions, the government has to play a really important role to provide that infrastructure so that economic growth can come. Roads can't be built by individual firms. Roads have to be built by the government. Flood protection needs to be by the government. So the Ministry of Water and Environment is crucial in providing many of these physical infrastructures, but also the whole institutional infrastructure, providing the education um, to, to develop and be able to do things like smart economies and others um, to allow uh, the country to grow. And then finally, one of the things we want to be careful um, at is Professor Joseph Stiglitz, who's a Nobel Prize laureate in economics and also was former chief economist of the World Bank, mentioned a few things and he said, how do we measure performance and social growth? We want to be careful. And they said, impact on GDP may be misleading. We want to look at that because much of it can go to foreign owners and managers. And GDP does not include the value of resource depletion and environmental degradation. Um, we've showed that we can do both. So we want to be careful, but just not to have a single measure. In many areas, adverse effects of environment and health can be very significant, as we've shown. GDP says nothing about sustainability or inclusiveness of growth. That's why some of these other metrics like inclusive wealth, which is related to the capital of human, nat natural, and productive, and the fact that we have to keep that growing to be sustainable. So what we said is you need to bear in mind um, what we measure affects what we do. 
If we measure the wrong thing, we'll do the wrong thing. So with that message in mind, we have to be careful as we move forward. And so the development challenge is great, but as I've worked over the last 15 years in Uganda, I see a great um, receptiveness to grow sustainably in Uganda. And if there are a few things that, that I think about in, as we look here is we have to listen across disciplines. Engineers have to talk to agronomists, have to talk to um, energy specialists, to social scientists. Um, we need all resources on hand. We have to make sure the limited resources we have are used productively and without waste. We need to collect more data. We need evidence-based decision-making, and that needs to be based first on data. We can build models, but our models are only as good as the data that we validate them to. So we have to keep measuring our environment and other actions. We need to use all the tools that are out there. There have been many tools developed locally um, in Uganda with development partners. We have to use them together and we need to train our staff in the public sector and in the private sector to use these tools. And finally, we need to communicate our findings and language for decision making. Many of us in the room today are, are engineers or economists or others. We have to make our message to be understood by policymakers so we can be there. And as Pro Professor Stiglitz says, we have to be careful because the metric we use ma matter as we go forward. The last thing I want to do is to leave you with a message since most of us here are, are engineers um, to bring something from economics, which I think is a valuable view as we look at this. Um, Kenneth Boulding, a very famous economist in the United States said, if I'm going to live below a dam, I would much rather have it built by an engineer than an economist. So I think we can say amen to that. But nevertheless, the economist comes into the picture perhaps by asking the awkward question as to whether the dam should be built in the first place. So the issue is there is a great need across all sectors in Uganda. We only have limited amounts of investment from domestic investment sources and from donors and from loans and other things. The question is, where is it best used? used? Because there's a concept in economics that I think we all need to take with us all the time, and that's called the opportunity cost. We could spend something, we could spend some money and it would do well, but how much more might it get from an alternative use if we spent it on somewhere else? So I think all of us need to come and have dialogue across sectors, agriculture, water, transport, energy, education, where is that dollar best spent? And even within our ministries, where is it spent so that we can get the most for it because we have a limited resource? So finally, I thank you again for inviting me to be part of this. I cannot look forward enough until when I can be back and see you in person. I am happy to say that last week I got my second jab of Pfizer, so I'll be ready to come as soon as You'll let me there. I have two tickets that are still open to Kampala, which I hope to use soon. And I wish my blessing on this week that the dialogue that will go forward will be productive and the ultimate goal will be um, inclusive development for the, the wonderful citizens of Uganda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Are you still hearing from us? Hi, Professor. Yes. Thanks very much. And there has been uh, Sandra's applause for you here in the room for your presentation. And uh, thanks for drinking the Elgon, certainly Ugandan coffee, as well as uh, eating from the, um, the rich ingredients in the, the Rolex. Though it was a little dark, in Uganda, we don't make them dark, Professor. Well, we shall engage him um, as we move on. Um, we are now preparing to go into the panel discussions. And uh, as the panel comes up to the podium, Josephine and I will be inviting them one by one. We shall split the entire group into two so that we can have uh, them in two different clusters. We will start with Miss Elsie Atafwa, the UNDP resident representative for Uganda.
So my job here is quite simple. As you make your way up, I will just speak a little about you. Uh, Ms. Elsie is the resident representative for Uganda UNDP. In this position, she represents Leeds and is accountable for harnessing and directing the full potential of UNDP's capabilities and associated partnerships in support of national development goals and strategies in Uganda. Prior to this, she led, managed, and coordinated UNDP's climate and forest team and office in Africa and provided overall strategic direction, policy, and technical guidance to 28 countries in the Africa portfolio. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Elsie. She has already taken up her seat. The next panelist will be um, the Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Water and Environment, Alfred Okotokidi, represented by Dr. Florence Grace Adongo. All right. And as Dr. Uh, Adongo takes her seat on the podium, a little bit of information about her. She's the Director, Water Resources Management. She's the Chair, Uganda Water and Environment Week. She served in the Water Fraternity for 30 years under various positions. She's the first female director in the history of water and environment. She steered the launch of the Uganda Water and Environment Week 2018 and still carries on to support the team that is doing it now. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Mr. Ramazan Gobi, a lecturer at Makere University Business School. Mr. Ramadan Gobi is an economist and policy analyst. He's a disciple of economics that works, and he teaches the same at Makere University Business School. I think they were speaking about people like Mr. Ramadan Gobi when you are building a <laughs> Wasita Bridge. Um, at Makere University Business School, he heads a think tank, the MOVES Economic Forum. His research interests are in industrial policy, economic policy, and political economy. He is a regular pundit in media on economic issues and writes a weekly column, Are You Listening, Mr. President, in the Sunrise newspaper. He has consulted with Overseas Development Institute, ODI, UK, International Labour Organization, International Monetary Fund, Frederick Ebert Stiftung, Financial Sector Deepening Uganda, Government of Uganda, Action Coalition for Development and Environment, and many others. He is the director at the Uganda Development Corporation, the government investment. Um. Thank you, Josephine, and uh, um, let's clap for them. Um, there are two ladies on the podium and one gentleman, and therefore the gentleman is disadvantaged, so we will change the order and start with him instead of the ladies first. Um, Ramadan, um, away from the questions that I had, um, I need you to, to start us off by making a one-minute uh, uh, rejoinder. Professor um, Strespeck talked about the GDP as being the main measure of economic growth and all that. And uh, we know that now, uh, better informed, um, the world over, many people are saying GDP might actually be misleading in terms of water safety, environment, which is sustainable, conservation, what is now, in your view, supposed to be the best you know, solution to looking at this? How do we achieve sustainability minus only talking about walls, walls, and tarmac for, um, you know, for GDP growth? Thank you very much, Charles, and uh, good, e good evening to all the participants protocols observed. Um, I'm glad that the professor swung this keynote to the direction which is quite uh, more comfortable for us economists these days. We're encouraging the world to look at development sustainably in terms of not necessarily looking at what we are accumulating in numbers, which are read to us by those with the powers to read numbers, but also by looking at what exactly is pertaining to our lives. Uh, Joseph Stiglitz, the professor he has quoted, 
we teach him now religiously in development economics because he transformed the thinking at World Bank on how we measure development. Because um, at one time, it was purely about GDP. And the GDP is like a calculator which only adds and it doesn't have a function for subtraction. You are only adding whatever has been produced, the monetary value in, in a year, but uh, without looking at, at what cost. That opportunity cost, the concept he ended with. So um, there are, of course, alternatives which are being tried every day. And uh, now that the UN brought us the Sustainable Development Goals, in there, we have almost whatever it takes to, to look at alternative way of getting inclusive development. And in that, some have said, why, do, why don't we try gross national happiness? <laughs> and we look at development more comprehensively, because you know the end result of every human being, why we wake up and work so hard or do whatever we do, we are searching for one major aspect, happiness. And this happiness, development economists have reduced it to three major aspects. The freedom to choose, the freedom of choice, self-esteem, and sustainable income. That word sustainability, sometimes we, we, we misunderstand it. It, it, look, it. it seems a bit complex, but in simple terms, it just asks us a question. Whether in whatever we are doing to make ourselves happy, we are mindful of the future generation. That we must leave behind a stock of resources which is equivalent to what we inherited. So are we, when we are fishing in Lake Victoria, are we mindful that Lake Victoria must remain intact in the same way we inherited it for the future generation. That's the sustainability bit. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pose my question to Ms. Elsie. Um, as a UN agency, you support Uganda through many sectors, one of which is the water and environment sector. How critical are water and the environment resources in Uganda's socioeconomic transformation? Well, first, let me uh, thank the uh, ministry for inviting the United Nations family to be on the panel. And I'm humbled to be here presenting the team here and the, the resident coordinator is here as well, and my colleague uh, from FAO. Um, let me also uh, say that this discussion is really timely for a number of reasons. First, when we're starting the rollout of the National Development Plan 3. And when we are also talking about the sustainable development goals and the decade of action. In other words, there's a lot that we need to do within a short period of time. But it's also coming at a time that we are talking about post-COVID recovery and resilience building. And when we talk about building forward better, it is not only about building forward better, but also building forward greener. And this is very important. And this sets the tone for our conversation today. Now, to answer the question, the importance of water and environment to you know, socioeconomic transformation, I want to situate it by looking at two parameters the socio-economic transformation and the word security. That's very important. Now, when you look at Africa, and this, I'm going to tackle the first one first, the socio-economic transformation, the role of water and environment. In the case of Africa, and also Uganda in particular, our development is nature-based. And I think Professor Ken made my work easier by talking about that. What does it mean? It means that when we are seeking a development that will reduce poverty, when we are seeking a development that will create wealth, when we are seeking a development that says they're leaving no one behind, we need to look at where does it come from. Now, you take the case of Uganda. Let's take the energy sector, for example. We get about 28% of our energy electricity from hydro, which means, and I think if Karuma comes online, that's even more, which means that we need that energy for industrialization, and it comes from water. So you can already see the interconnection between water and energy and industrialization. You take the agriculture sector, for example, and uh, my colleague Antonio is here, and he'll clearly tell you, you will need that water for irrigation, for example. And that's very important. 
68 to 70 percent of our population here in Uganda are very much dependent on the agriculture sector. And therefore, you cannot talk about agriculture without talking about water. You cannot decouple the two. You talk about tourism, exactly the same thing. Environment and water is very much hinged. Tourism is hinges on environment and water. If you take, for example, uh, the, the places that we go, our gorillas, they are in the forest. Uh, our wetlands, the bears are there. So when somebody comes bed watching here, they come because of the wetlands. So, so you can already see that water and environment is not an add-on, as Professor Ken said. It is at the center of national development processes in the country. And I can go on and on. You also take the social services, for example. Health becomes very important. When the, the minister in waiting uh, talked about the fact that, you know, during COVID times, we need water to wash our hands. We need water for drinking. We need water for so many things. You can already link that to health. So by and large, the development agenda of Uganda is very much dependent on that. And therefore, the way we are going to utilize resources becomes very important if we link it back to leave no one behind. If we link it back to increases in income. If we link it back to the agenda of the 2040 that we, we are all supporting. Now, let me then shift to the word security because I don't think the, the organizers just put the word security there. Why security? Why water and environment security? Why does it matter for a country like Uganda? Now, it's very important that as we develop, we look at the trade-offs. It is very important because you can't be industrializing, opening up new wetland areas, therefore destroying what, your wetland, which comes at a cost to the, to the country because then you're going to spend more money for water, generating water quantity and quality. So the trade-offs have to be managed. In other words, as we look at development hinged on water and environment, we also have to think how secured would that be in the future. We cannot trade it off now by just doing things anyhow. We need to ensure that the pathway is green, the pathway is sustainable. So if you take pollution, for example, if we don't manage the industries properly and the way, the way they manage waste, you can then generate waste that then goes into the river and the lakes, and the government spends thousands of dollars or millions of dollars trying to treat that waste. That is where the trade-off comes in. So just to conclude, in the interest of time, it is important for us to look into the, the, the importance of water and environment as part of the sustainable development agenda, as part of NDP3 implementation, and therefore they would contribute both from the agriculture sector, the environment sector, the tourism sector, the transport sector, the fishery sector, it is very important. And we have to manage that relationship between nature and people as we move forward because of the importance of securing that for the future of the country. Thank you. Thank you, Elsie. Um, to, to Dr. Grace Adongo, um, the Uganda's economy is going to continue um, relying on the available stock of water, the environmental and natural resources to produce um, the needed goods and services. How has the Ministry um, of Water and Environment positioned itself to ensure that uh, water and environmental security is uh, assured for the country? Are we, are we doing enough as the Ministry, as government? Is what we have done so far adequate. Okay, thank you very much, moderator. Uh, just as said, and my previous speakers have said, water and environment is fundamental. And uh, it's also recognized in the vision 2040 for Uganda as an opportunity which can help to catalyze industrialization in Uganda. As a ministry, we have positioned ourselves in various ways. One of them is to ensure that government provides the appropriate enabling environment for sustainable development and management of the water resources. That is why we have a dedicated institution, Ministry of Water and Environment, to look at this pertinent issue. Secondly, we have also uh, set up uh, various institutions that enables us to monitor, regulate, and develop the water resources and the environment resources in an even and sustainable manner. 
the ministry has not only done that, we realize that most of the stakeholders in, in what an environment, that is the whole population of Uganda, are not aware of the importance what an environment uh, has in social and economic development of Uganda. Most of the time, people take water and environment for granted. They think it is God-given, it is there, and I'm sure even they are doubting Thomas is because as I'm talking, you're looking at Lake Victoria. Now, if I say the water is not available, nobody will understand. So one of the key things is it caused us to rethink how we can implement management and development of water resources in, and environment in this country together with stakeholders. So it was very important that we launched the Uganda Water and Environment Week as a platform that brings stakeholders together to dialogue, to exchange knowledge and experience, to share uh, findings from practitioners and experts so that we can build our capacity and have a positive mindset towards water and environment. We also realize that uh, in most cases, water resources and environment is looked at as an environment issue, not a development issue. We are here to put to all stakeholders that management and development of water and environment is a development issue and must be put at the center. Just we are, as we have heard today, the country depends on its stock of natural resources. And these natural resources are interconnected. And we need to know and we are having increased demand for these water resources because the population is increasing and we want to transform the country into a middle-income country. So the demands for these natural resources are increasing. And yet we must make sure that we have proper management for the people right now and the future. So as a ministry, we are doing a lot of awareness campaigns, sensitization. We have established a Water Resource Institute to share case studies of best practices do applied research, do dialogue, and train on what works. We have not only stopped there. We have a robust monitoring system, which we are continuously upgrading to cope up with the technology so that we are able to monitor and forecast, understand water and environment, so that we can talk in terms of figures. We have not stopped there. We have now gone, we realize that uh, maybe technical people, we scientists, have been talking among ourselves, and yet to negotiate for more resources, you must convince an economy. That's why, for me, I had to go for an MBA, and I had to go economics and business management, so that I can bring water resources views from economic and accounting terms, so that it can be appreciated. That's why you have seen Professor giving us quotations, because the ministry had to undertake studies on water and environment contribution to economic transformation of this country. So we are doing a number of things in the technical areas. Not only that, we have positioned ourselves to present Uganda's interest on transboundary water resources. You know that Uganda is both an upstream country to Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo, and it's a downstream uh, and it's also, I mean, it's these countries that have counted are upstream Uganda, but Uganda is also upstream other countries. So within the National Convention on Transboundary Water Resources, we are obliged to follow certain issues in order to develop shared water resources. We have built capacity and we are very strong on matters of transboundary. And we have a number of projects in the country that are related to transboundary water management projects, including some of the uh, hydropower transmission lines to South Sudan, to DR Congo, and others. And we have other projects with DR Congo in Leaf, Lake, Victor Lake Eldred and Albert. We also have others with Kenya and Tanzania joint program. Uganda has also mobilized stakeholders. I don't know which particular stakeholder is represented here. As a ministry, we think that all stakeholders should come at table to discuss matters that pertain to our life. And in line with the national policy and the law, 
stakeholder involvement is very important, including the private sector, to see even after you have taken the water, how are you using it? How are you sustainably using the wood, fuel wood? Are you having energy saving stoves? Are you planting trees? There are many initiatives which uh, culminated into our prevent activities to showcase of what the ministry is doing. We are trying as much as possible to lobby for support to ensure that we implement the resources and earn the benefits from the services of these natural resources in a more sustainable manner. So I, we have a long list, but above all, as a ministry, we must ensure that there is equitable access to all the benefits accruing from water and environment. And in that way, we both allocate, but we also regulate the usage, and we enforce the laws and measures that government has put in place, and also advise government on any emerging issues and how they should be handled. I just wanted to, through a yes or no answer, you gave us a very good um, lineup and achievements of training, and you talked about capacity building. Uh, directly under you, do you have some young ladies and gentlemen who are also following in your path and learning as much as you are doing for also sustainable uh, capacity to be left within the ministry and government? Yes, I do. Actually, oh. my directorate is the largest directorate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Just Dr. Finished. Adongo. In keeping with time, we must rush through um, quite a bit of what we wanted to ask. You spoke very well about the dedication that the ministry has to water and environment management, and but you also mentioned resource management, uh, the resources, so we speak about funding. And I'm going to bring that question to the economist in the room. Over the years, we see that the funding that is allocated to this sector reduces. If the sector is indeed as important as the picture that has been painted for us, why is it not being allocated enough resources? And what should the Ministry of Water and Environment do to convince the government that this sector requires the attention that is due to it. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine. Uh, first of all, this sector of water and environment is inadequate in terms of prioritization. Leave alone funding itself. The prioritization aspect is low. At least that's what we established when we started the National Development Plan 2, and uh, it's quite difficult to track water, environment, sanitation, and hygiene funding. There is a general lack of desegregated data in a budget allocation, as well as in statistics for waste and the environment sector, particularly sub-sector including data on grant transfers to local government or local governments. We also found that there is a lot of off-budget donor funding in this sector, although uh, recently there has been effort to integrate some of this funding in the national budget, beginning especially financial year 2018-19, but we still have a very big challenge in the sector as far as the integration of its funding in one basket is concerned. This undermines effective planning and budgeting, and it also gives sometimes a wrong overall picture of how the sector is being funded. During the NDP2 period, we found that nearly half half of the approved budgets for water environment activities were not released. 49% of the resources budgeted for water environment and its major orphans, sanitation and hygiene. Those monies were budgeted but not released. Our analysis of these budgets found that the sector on average experienced an annual funding deficit of 518 billion Uganda shillings. 
an equivalent of about $140 million for only that period of five years. Now, um, there is no criteria which is quite objective in allocating funding to this sector compared to other sectors. And this is something which the sector needs to, to look at very seriously. Which criteria should we use when we are allocating budget for the sector? To me, I think the following can help. First of all, beginning with the internal reorganization of the sector, we start with institutional issues of establishing a sound legal, institutional, and the policy framework for the sector. It's lacking to coordinate this sector. The sector tends to be quite scattered between the Ministry of Water and the Environment, our host today, but also the other MDS, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, local governments. They have components of especially sanitation and hygiene that they handle. Yet there is no institutional or policy framework to coordinate them. There is, of course, uh, usually the, when you talk to stakeholders, they talk of an MOU of 2001. Uh, but this is not legally binding, and uh, we found it largely uh, superfluous. Secondly, you need to consolidate the funding for this sector. If it is going really to mobilize more funding. There's a need to consolidate it such that uh, we focus on a comprehensive, in, in, in a comprehensive way, we have a comprehensive approach to the water sanitation, hygiene, as well as environmental management. There's also need to create a separate budget line for the wash sector especially that WASH component, to address the issue of low prioritization of the especially sanitation and hygiene, which has led to very low funding for those aspects. We also need to disaggregate the MDA program to separate the budgets for WASH and other MDA activities. We found a lot of for example, in programs and sub-programs, we tend to um, put the monies together, and it is quite difficult to know the line which separates the money for WASH from the money of other activities of the, uh, the, the core, especially the core activities of some of these MDAs. For example, when you go to Ministry of Education, uh, it, it becomes very difficult to trace the money for sanitation and the hygiene from their budget lines. I'm now talking of other MDAs particularly, other than water and the environment, which is the, the mother of, of, of this particular activity. So most of the initiatives, uh, Josephine, in this sector are not linked with the clear financing mechanisms. And we thought that if the sector is to really get more funding, it needs first internal uh, 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 reorientation to make the sector more integrated and coordinated and then after that there is need to work out on the for example effective communication of what the contribution of the sector is to the economy because it seems the people who sit in budgeting rooms they usually get more obsessed with the observables you know, observables are easy to budget for. A road, a dam. But when you say environment, and if somebody sees 500 billion for environmental management, it's like, what is this for? Because environment seems to be quite abstract. I, I, I will stop there. Thank you very much. And, and I think that's the reason why we have these kinds of gatherings. Um, if only they get to watch them and understand why exactly water and environment are important. Charles? Thank you, Josephine. Um, Ms. Elsie, we are talking inclusive development and sustainability across the country. Um, 
Uganda has uh, recently, especially last year, created uh, by law um, a number of urban new cities, actually, um, several of them. Um, what, in your view, do you think that needs to be done to ensure that uh, these new cities also um, take up the issue of water and environment security so that it is all inclusive across the country? So, thank you very much. Uh, if I may uh, just uh, say one or two points uh, in addition to what the professor said on, on the finance before I come to your point, because it's a very important point that he makes. Uh, I think we need to also look at innovative financing, which we haven't tapped into mostly, including areas such as payment for ecosystem services. We have private sector here that are using a lot of water, yet uh, maybe they're not, they not really paying for what they are actually using. And how can we engage them strategically in terms of catchment areas, supporting communities and things like that, I think becomes very key. But beyond financing, it's very important that we look at policy shifts. It's very important because you do have situations where, for example, you take hospitals that are still using biomass, yet they can use electricity because we are producing excess electricity. How do you then give them tariffs that allows them to do you know, things differently? So what I'm saying is that funding is important, but also we need to go beyond that to look at how is the sectors, agriculture, mining, and others, mainstreaming issues around environment and water into their processes, value chains, and uh, things without you know, making sure that they do things uh, right beyond corporate social responsibility. So, Professor, I just thought I would add to that. Now, coming back to the, uh, the question around cities that are opening up, I think, yes, the government's prerogative to open up new cities. I think there's a couple of things that... Uh, we need to encourage and would like to encourage from the UN point of view. One of them is on smart planning. It's going to be important how planning is done and how planning is done in an integrated manner. In other words, you don't want to just to see agriculture planning for agriculture, forestry planning for forestry, you know, uh, mining planning for mining, but then how do you bring all the actors together in a similar way to make sure that, you know, one thing doesn't impact on the other. So I think planning becomes very important from the point of view of natural resource governance. And this is where you have to bring in different stakeholders, private sector, uh, you have to bring in you know, local communities, you know, traditional leaders in that space. So I think that is very, very important. The other thing I think will be very important is uh, really looking at incentive mechanisms. I like to focus on this a bit more because sometimes when we want to go at scale, uh, within municipalities, within communities, it becomes very important what kind of incentives do you give? So, for example, you, you would see that in some countries there's a lot of focus on fiscal instruments, which is an incentive for, for, for cities to do things differently. Uh, I think there's one, I don't know whether it's an African country or in Asia, where if, if, a, if a municipality grows more trees, they actually get more from the government budget as a result of that. Now, how are we going to look at planning cities in a new way where you can incentivize these cities to do things uh, very, very differently? So that's another way. The other thing that I think will be quite important to do is in terms of the kind of investments uh, that we put into these places. You know, investment can take different forms, and I think, again, a reflection on that will be very important as we create these new cities. You know, you just don't want them to be there. Uh, uh, you want to make sure that every, the investments are there from all angles to make sure that they can operate at the level that they do. Then, of course, I think one thing that COVID has taught us is how we optimize innovation and digitalization. I think that's going to be key. Professor Ken, I think, alluded to that. Now, there are different ways of, of looking at it. I think recently, we, together, the United Nations family with the National Forest Authority, we have just developed you know, a, a, a deforestation visualization platform that in real time, you're seeing what is happening to your city. Now, that can inform decision making, that can inform investment, and what type of investment that should be made. So again, Digitalization, innovation, innovative approaches becomes very important conversation with the cities. Uh, and in that regard, I think we want to encourage a lot of South-to-South -South cooperation, which is part of the policy support and knowledge brokering role that the United Nations brings. Now, how do you train cities, whether within Uganda or within the Africa region, or within, you know, uh, you know uh, with other regions in Latin America and Asia, to make sure that they do things differently? Recently, we've done quite some good work in Karamoja, 20 Karamoja with with other cities to see how best they can draw lessons and vice versa so that we can learn from that process. So by and large, I mean, there's a lot that has to be done 
I just want to sum up by saying that we will need to invest, we will need to provide incentives, we will need to look at integrated approaches to development because it can't be done alone and we have to look at issues such as digitalization. And on our part, as a United Nations family, I mean the cooperation framework that was recently signed by the resident coordinator and His Excellency the President provides us a great instrument to use to, to look at new, new ways of doing business when it comes to cities and smart cities. And, and we are very much committed in providing policy support, programmatic support, uh, and other support, uh, including at the local uh, government level, uh, to, to address some of these issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elsie. I'm going to turn to you, Dr. Adongo, and this will be my last question to you to keep with time. Uh, Professor Ken spoke to shocks, and I'm going to look at the water and environment sector. We've had quite a number of shocks from there in this past year. How is your sector responding to the current challenges caused by COVID-19, and then also the rising water levels, flooding, job loss, and so on? What should the country do to put an end to these shocks, or effectively adapt? Uh, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Yes, in the past few years, uh, the country has been experiencing rising water levels, which has resulted into floods in many parts of the country. The background to these rising water levels is linked to environmental degradation, which is also linked to population increase and uh, increasing demand for natural resources. Now, the Minister of Water and Environment, as the custodian of these resources, has, un has, uh, has had to undertake a number of activities, some of which we have already been taking, because part of the management of water resources and its development requires you also to manage the risk that is involved in the, in the resource, within the resources. So one of the things we have had to do and we have been doing over time is to ensure that we have a robust monitoring, forecasting, and uh, early warning system. That's why it was possible for Uganda National Meteorological Authority to give alerts and warnings about the unpredictable and unusual weather events. Unfortunately, it has been going on for the last one or so years, we are not having proper dry spell. So as a ministry, we have to make sure that we inform and communicate a lot and warn. But we are also leading a national uh, task team, which is in charge of management of these floods, which brings in various institutions. And we come out with a national strategic uh, plan for management of these floods. In terms of jobs, you may wish to know that the international uh, com community assessed the importance of water resources specifically and found out that three quarters of the jobs in the world are directly or indirectly dependent on water and environment resources. And therefore, it might not be easy for you to say this job was created by the Minister of Water and Environment. You need to look at the benefit accruing from water resources, from the environment, and how they are being used to provide services to different sectors and the community in the country. I, in my earlier remarks, I also told you that the water and environment has come out, standing out as a key preventive uh, contributor to COVID-19. So these are very key important areas. While some jobs could have been lost, those that have been given support, access to water and, and environment resources have continued. Actually, that is why you also saw that some of the jobs that were resilient were linked to water and environment. So uh, I think that is our contribution. In terms of uh, the rising water levels, it is still continuing. It has not stopped. And uh, we are expecting the long rainy season to have another 
important, another, another perhaps not very impressive event. But what the Minister of Water and Environment has done is to demarcate all the high risk areas and have asked those who are living in those high risk zones or who have been vested to stay or move to higher ground where there is safety. We have continued to provide safe water and, uh, and the sanitation, uh, in, I mean improved sanitation and provide essential facilities that can enable us to fight COVID and other uh, water related diseases or environment related diseases. The ministry is also undertaking enforcement and restoration. That's why this morning there was a, a launch for tree planting because the key issue is that the natural infrastructure that used to retain, keep water, maintain the cycle has been destroyed. This morning, I mean, you heard from the, from the chief guest that 50% of the forest cover, which used to retain water and keep water and protect the environment from erosion, have been degraded. And now we are having a big challenge. So we are trying to do restoration enforcement, regulate the water use. It is the Minister of Water and Environment that determines how much ESCOM in ginger, any hydropower in this country must release at any specific time. So we are doing monitoring, 24-hour monitoring, and ensuring that we use it to check that the water is released properly, but also check for compliance. We are also constructing infrastructure for water storage so that in times of drought or, or in times of scarcity, we have storage. I must say that we are still not doing well in terms of that infrastructure because of the limited resources. But that is very fundamental if we have to be resilient in the fluctuations of the weather and climate change impact. We also have uh, we, 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 we are also having, like, uh, the Water Resource Institute that we have established. We have Applied Technology Center that helps us to acquaint the water and environment users with the possible technologies that can be used to enhance their resilience, cope with the increasing demand, and reduce use. We are also linked with the private sector, both in development of water resources for various uses, but we are also doing what is called water stewardship program. And we are having this to manage water based on a catchment. This catchment enables us to protect the water resources so that the business people can have their business sustainably managed. Thank we you very much, Dr. Adoa. I know that you have quite a bit that you are doing, but we, we really need to move to the next question and the next panel. So I'll allow you to say one of the other things that you're okay. doing. The last one which I was saying is that we have moved to the, especially the industrial sector, the small, medium, and uh, micro enterprises. How to optimize the water that you use so that you increase productivity and maximize your profit and reduce the waste pollution that is happening in the environment. And this one, we are doing it collaboratively, and the private sector is indirectly making input into the sector to manage the water resources in the catchment, but also reduce on pollution and maximize their profit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Adongo. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands uh, to clap for the three. And uh, may I request them to resume their seats. We are going to invite the second cluster of uh, panelists, and we shall have a similar uh, approach to uh, tickling the questions, and then they respond. Um, we are going to start with Honorable Mariam Mayanjang Kalubo, Minister of Lands and Environment in the Buganda Kingdom. Honorable Mariam is an accountant by profession. She, from 2005 to 2013, she was a state minister for gender and community development. Uh, 2013 to 2015, state minister for community development, Bulunji Mwansi, and in charge of royal travels. Minister of gender, community development, and in charge of royal travels, again from 2015 to 2019. 
and 2019 to date, she's the Minister for Lands, Agricultural Cooperatives, Environment and Community Development, Burundi Wansi. Thank you very much. Honorable Mariam has already uh, taken up her seat. The next panelist is going to be Professor Alex Ariho, the Director General Excel Hot Consult Agribusiness Incubator. Professor Alex Ariho is uh, Chief Executive Officer and Director General of Excel Hot Consult Agribusiness Incubator. Uh, it has headquarters in Ghana, operates in 55 African Union member countries. Alex is an active visiting professor in several universities globally, including American Heritage University of Southern California in USA, Cape Coast University in Ghana, Sokoine University of Agriculture, Kabale University, and Ilanda University in Uganda, among others. Thank you very much. The professor has already taken up his seat as well. Finally, but not of the least importance, we have Ms. Blake Carol Gloria, National Coordinator, Youth Go Green. Ms. Blake Carol Gloria is an active member of Youth Go Green Uganda. She represented the Ugandan youth at a Greener Africa Youth and Climate Change Dialogue that was held in the margins of the 2019 African Union Summit in the Republic of Niger. Carol obtained a Bachelor of Science in Environment and Natural Resources Management, a qualification that enhanced her knowledge of environment management. Ladies and gentlemen, let's clap for the ladies and gentlemen on the podium. And we are going to take 30 minutes, just like we did with the first panel. And uh, we shall ask them questions to which we uh, shall expect you to answer very concisely so that we can have as more uh, questions put to you as possible. Let me start with the youngest on the panel. Um, and the most common complaint of the young people, this country, over 70 percent, close to 80 percent, um, youth-based, but then there is this big animal called unemployment. Um, what role do you think water and environment resources can play in addressing the problem of unemployment? Uh, thank you so much. Well, to start with, natural resources play a very important role in ecosystem services. They provide us with a lot of services that create employment to us. Uh, some of these are wetlands, we can go fishing, we can go harvest a few of these resources like the catching materials, the clay, the bricks, provided we do it sustainably, we can do that. So we can have nature-based solutions these are indirect benefits from the environment resources. Uh, conservation activities such as reforestation, tree nurseries, advocacy, and capacity building campaigns about these resources. Some of these resources are at the verge of destruction. Um, swamp reclamation for infrastructure development if they take on the role to restore the damages through advocacy on SDG 13 and SDG interconnection with environment being the foundation. So the youth can engage in different activities to restore the damaged environment. And among these, we can plant trees, we can restore the damaged forest. Then we as Youth Go Green can engage in different activities since we are a youth-led organized group We've so far carried out a few activities and I will mention a few that we intend to do. We have re waste recycling for charcoal briquettes, charcoal briquette production. This is an alternative to forests. So other than increasing pressure on the already decreasing number of trees or forest count, we can restore, resort to briquette making as youth and we can sell them. It's a booming industry as per now. Then, we have plastic recycling. They've already mentioned that plastics are quite a big challenge in our environment. So once we engage in recycling these or collecting them or making bricks out of them, making pavers out of them, these are all ventures that we can carry on as youth. The establishment of regional tree nursery beds to raise 110 million tree seedlings. So these are greening skills 
and training and entrepreneurship that the youth can engage in to see that we restore the environment. So this is on the other part of restoring the environment that we can engage in. However, we can also tap into the opportunities that the environment or the resources in the environment give back to us. Because Uganda largely depends on the environment stock of resources for development. So we can participate in agriculture, like I have my own forest. I looked at my transcript and of all these course units, about 35, which one can I concentrate in and make a living out of it? And given the fact that I had land as a resource, well, I went back to the village and planted a forest. That's one thing the youth out there can do to make a living out of it. Then the new technologies such as irrigation. We've mentioned agriculture of late is facing a challenge because the environment is being challenged. The climate is changing day and night. When we receive rainfall, we have it in a terrible amount than we need it. When we don't have it, we literally have prolonged drought. So if the youth can venture into these, like new technologies, we can practice irrigation. If Egypt, that taps from the source of the Nile, back there at their home, they can tap and do agriculture throughout the year. Why not the youth to venture into these technologies, spread them all over, and then we can have agriculture being prepped all year round. We have beekeeping. Okay. Let me just read them through. We have beekeeping, we have aquaculture, we have value addition, we have innovation around green energy, like eco stoves, green jobs, and biotechnology and genetic engineering. We have making papers from plastics, forestry, partnerships, and you know, partnerships with these organizations and volunteering, like I can volunteer with Youth Go Green. And this exposes me. It gives me the opportunity to meet probably potential employers. I am learning new things. I am learning new skills. Otherwise, how are we going to increase on our knowledge base right. and be competent out there when we do not know or expose ourselves to know? Thank you. Thank you very much, Faro. Um, I'm going to pose my question to Professor Alex. We've just heard from a youth, and I'm curious to know what lessons Uganda can learn from other countries related to establishing job incubation hubs around natural resources as key pillars for economic transformation and development. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Josephine and uh, the participants. Uh, first of all, is to start by appreciating the Minister for the invitation and this opportunity to uh, to share today. I will straight away uh, respond to your question, but I will start with where Carol ended from. And I will start by uh, recognizing a, one of my mentors in house here that I met this afternoon. And uh, one of the things that I appreciate when I met him 15 years back was the kind of opportunity to allow the youth to interface with us or interface with them when they were advancing big concepts of landscape management, talking about agroforestry, and it was very hard for us to appreciate. But he made, or they made as an institution, an opportunity for the youth to interface with these seniors experts. And I want to recognize uh, David Dury, in-house for uh, <laughs> Rock. So as a starting point, one of the big lessons that you did mention, I sit in Ghana, I work with about 55 African countries, but member states of the African Union, as a technical arm of African Union. But the important part now that we're actually doing is providing the mentors and the experts that can interface with the young population. When we talk about conservation, when we talk about natural resources, the best way to ensure sustainable economic transformation is to make sure that the young people are the driving seat. So uh, that's one point, number one, that I would like us to take forward. Two, Professor Kane did mention about the demand post-industrial revolution. We are talking about technologies, we are talking about innovations, but it is important for us to see what other countries are doing to march and move at the speed. And one of the things is what we call skill and talent development. We must come up with new skill sets that will allow the new actors in the space to participate. 
You may talk about technology, but at the end of the day, how prepared are we? So it is important that we match what is it that uh, is happening outside. Another aspect that is important, and which you already I'm happy that we are discussing with the ministry and we are in advanced stages, is coming up with what you call water and environmental resources business incubation. It is important to think about investing in the sector, but investing in enterprises that are not going to survive, that are not sustainable, is a wastage of resources. So E plus R is equal to O. The events that are happening today, the responses that we are going to take today in this discussion is as equal to the output that we are going to get tomorrow. So sustainability is based on that. It is E plus R is equal to O. So as a lesson, let's not talk about increased investment if the results are going to change. And we are the ones to make the results change because we need to respond differently. And if I take one example, since you talked about lessons outside and within, a country like Ghana now, five years back, they started a program what they call One District, One Factory, supported by World Bank. They designed a program that is taking into consideration water and environmental management, but they had to take stock what kind of jobs, employment, and awareness you're going to create along the entire program. Now, there are factories based at the district level. Now, two years back, after the lessons of three years, they progressed the program and started now one incubator, one factory. Each factory is supposed to create a system of incubating the startups and SMEs that are emerging. And that is very fundamental. If you are talking about how do you create sustainability, sustainability does not come in air. We must invest, we must plan systematically, underline the skills, the skill set with the margin opportunities. And when you talk about resources, what are we talking about? So it is important that we match that. And I think these are some of the lessons that we can pick from the rest of the world. Thank you, uh, Professor. Um, coming to Honorable Mariam Mayanja from the great Buganda Kingdom, um, I want to relate the question coming to you from the presentation of Professor Ken. He said, he said we have to listen across disciplines and we must communicate and involve everybody um, to ensure that uh, water and environmental security can lead to socio-economic transformation of Uganda. Um, one question, but with two limbs, uh, Madam Minister. Do you think that uh, um, government is doing enough to involve cultural institutions? If, if yes, tell us one or two examples. If no, um, Tell us what needs to be done better or more by government to involve organizations or institutions such as yours, um, and there are many across the country. But the, sec the second limb of that question is, uh, what do you think that kingdoms like Buganda can play to ensure that water and their environmental resources can contribute more effectively um, in order for the country to realize some of these aspirations the House is discussing? Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator, um, fellow participants. Uh, let me first thank you for inviting us as a kingdom, and most especially inviting me as the minister in charge of environment and water. As moderator said, I actually come from the great kingdom. We really cherish the kingdom, and we are proud of it. Um, most of you here, you must agree with me that this kingdom is, I think, is the longest. It has been in existence since 900 years ago. It started with Sekabaka Chintu, and there came a time when development was required in the kingdom, and the Kabaka called, um, I've forgotten the name, I'll remember it, 
started this spirit of Burundi Wansi. And Burundi Wansi, it is the spirit which catered for development. And that's why Buganda developed and the rest of Uganda. I must answer these questions, I think, simultaneously, but let me start with the first one which you asked me about the contribution of the government. I must say yes or no. Uh, yes, when you look at Buganda Kingdom, uh, when we, our tombs in Kasubi were burnt, the government came in and contributed something. So there we can see as a kingdom, the, the government helped the kingdom. There are so many programs which we do in the kingdom, and we do these programs together with the government, the central government, especially programs regarding, concerning health, a lot of immunization, HIV, uh, fistula, you've had the Kabaka, Kabaka's run, but most of those programs we also do them with the central government. So there I, I must say the government is helping us, but on the other hand, there are so many other things which the kingdom is demanding from the, from the government. In, when we look at the topic we are discussing right now, for us as a kingdom, and you know, you very well know it is a cultural institution relying on cultural norms, and our culture depends on the environment. Our culture, I must repeat it, depends on the environment. And we see the government is, do, is not doing enough to protect the environment. And yet for us in the kingdom, we cherish and we, we want to conserve, preserve, and promote the environment. As I said, when you go to Blank, you can see that Royal Mile. Now we have started putting there our totems. Each one of us in Uganda has a totem, and those are our natural resources. But when you look at the, the data or the figures which we get from the Wildlife Authority, they are alarming. Those animals are disappearing. So it is our concern as a kingdom to see to it that those totems of ours, the natural resources, are well protected. And we see the laws are not being implemented. The laws are there, but they are not being implemented. When it comes to the protection, today in the morning I was at Lake Victoria. We are, we are carrying out a Blunji Wans program regarding this Filippi Floppy boat which was brought yesterday. And we saw people encroaching on the lake. They have built structures and they are not abiding with the law which requires 200 meters away from the shores of the lake. So we can see that the government is not doing enough. I think I must stop there with that question. Uh, on the second question, you asked the role played by the kingdom. The kingdom is playing a lot regarding water and the environment. We have, we carry out several programs, and one of them is that one which I mentioned, Burundi One Sea, and it is an annual, annual, it is an annual event, a weekly program, and our Kabaka, our dearest Kabaka, comes out of his palace, goes to his subjects, to the community, rather them to protect and have safe and clean water. That is one of his main reasons, or objectives of that Burundi once a week. And he encourages them to work so that they can earn a small income. But most important, with safe water, people are encouraged to harvest rainwater. People are encouraged to, if you have enough money, you can buy these uh, tanks. But as a kingdom, we have um, lobbied some partners which are helping us in this program of clean water and safe water, like him, Habitat for Humanity, uh, which buy a 500-liter tank, and we build a decent house 
for someone who is really in total need of a house and you make sure that house has a better latrine, clean water, as I said, and it is environmental friendly. We also have other partners like Wells of Life. They construct, they construct uh, wells in Busunju, Busuju and Singo, and these are friends from America. They have really done a tremendous job for the kingdom. We are lobbying for more. We are lobbying from the ministry. We have the structures. We have the people who are in need. And we have committed leaders in the kingdom. Honorable, I'll just allow you one more remark. Hmm? I'll just allow you one more remark, and then we'll move on to the next question. You had finished? One, that one more uh, answer from you. Oh. So that we can go to the next set of questions. I was going to elaborate on the kingdom structure, and that's the strongest, one of our strongest weapon we use. Because we have our king, we have the katikiro, we have the navigator, we have ministers like me, we have the, the county chiefs, the Saza chiefs, we have the Gombala chiefs, we have Miruka, we have the Batongoli, up to the grassroots. So for us in the kingdom, it's not very difficult to mobilize. So we have that skill also of mobilizing the community through our Kabaka, and once the Kabaka says something, it is an order. And the people love, and they really love the Kabaka and all those leaders, the topmost leaders of ours. Thank you very much, Honorable, for, for sharing that with us. I'm going to turn to you, Professor Alex, uh, for your closing remarks, just to pick from the 55 countries that you operate in. Uh, maybe you have some thoughts to share with us. What are the challenges that we need to overcome so that water and environment resources make a significant contribution to social economic growth? Uh, very quickly, as quickly as you can, uh, we've run out of time. Thank you so much. Uh, I think right away uh, from the previous uh, panel, the discussion, and uh, when you read uh, even the expectations of the viewers, the participants, I think the biggest challenge is that there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of uh, potential enterprises around the world and the world, but we, we give them leap financing mechanisms. And this is not only happening in Uganda, it is across in Africa. We don't give substantive, sustainable financing mechanism that is sustainable to make these businesses grow. So to me, the challenge number one is breaking through the financing mechanism of the emerging startups and SMEs that are going to invest and support the growth of the economy, the transformation of the economy without compromising the natural resources. The challenge number two is uh, uncoordinated policies, regulations, and frameworks across the region. You may be talking about industrialization now, but how are we making sure that the, the, the Minister of Trade that is engaging the businesses, that is engaging the private sector, the policies are harmonized to make sure that the private sector, while they are developing their businesses, they are taking into consideration water and environmental resources. So harmonization is important. We are now talking about the East African community. How is the East Africa community industrialization strategy harmonized to take advantage of the, 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 the emerging opportunity? For example, we need to ask ourselves, if we talk about today, we are talking about free trade area. How are our SMEs and startups within water and environmental resources prepared to take advantage of the free trade area? You may give people passports to move, but they keep the passports home because they are going nowhere. There are two things you can trade. You trade the product or your brain. Two things. So there is no shortcut. We, we need to know that satisfaction comes from a word with the last six, six letters actually is action. So if we expect to be satisfied, we need to act, and that's action. The last one is about the incentivization policy. 
how are we incentivizing the private sector, the people that are investing, even in this room, where are the banks? People who are banking the money that are coming from the ecosystem of water and environmental resources, the majority may not be here. So we need to create a mechanism, a specific platform that also brings the people that are actually also investing in water and also those who are emerging. They are not yet there, but in terms of sustainability, we prepare them. And lastly, when you put all these things together, I think as a country, we need to move step four. There's enough, something being done very good with the ministry to do with water for production, to do with water for sanitation, to do with water for development. But I think it's high time for the country to move a step of water for business development. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Professor. You. Um, finally, uh, Carol, in 30 seconds, um, I just want you to give some thoughts from the youth desk. Um, in your view, what policy measures do you think need to be put in place to harness the contribution of the youth in sustainable development and management of water and environment resources? In 30 seconds. Thank Stop. you. Like we all know, the youth own the future, or they have a higher stake in the future. So we need to revise the Uganda Investment Code to strictly observe green investment. We love our wetlands, we love our forests, so let them be preserved, let the laws be enacted and implemented. They are enacted, yes, but let them be implemented. Like the Climate Change Bill has inclusion of all and decentralizing powers, let it be enacted. Then we have sustainable use of environment resources and the SDGs and other policies. They also need to be observed. Then strictly implementing the polluter pays principle. This is a principle we have, it's a policy, but then you find out that many industries pollute and nothing is done to them. Then the precautionary principle should also be observed when they're assigning the EIS, well, they have very good information about the measures they're going to do afterwards. But after the project is certified, they divert to other things. So these are policies that want, we want to see being implemented. Thank you very much, Carol. Ladies and gentlemen, let's clap for Professor, for Ondra, for Mayanja, for Carol, uh, for their presentation and participation and sharing with us and the country and indeed the world, their knowledge. Um, thank you very much. Just over to Josephine. All right, so we've come to the end of uh, the event, but as we close, we invite you to join the ministry and partners all week for discussions during the Uganda Water and Environment Week. The conversations will be online, and uh, there will also be conversations on social media. You can follow the hashtag. Uh, tomorrow, there will be a dialogue on valuing water and environment, resources for socioeconomic transformation of Uganda, and it will be online, so you can join that as well. I'd like to invite Dr. Kalist to wrap up the conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, join me to first of all thank the keynote speaker and the panel. Kali, well to your water week, where I say, Kusinzira Eruzira, ever did to Kakom Terevu. Twagalo Kwani is a Kadekano, Igo, Tugana Kutambuza, Eda Chikanga, Makumi Atano, Tunyumim, Kubigana Masum Gwanga, Songa Ninja Ziva Dom Wiki. A uh, wiki ebadde mwebi wobe ngense kungu bagira omugenzi rais john pombe magufuli e yasa ogwenkomerero a uh, wiki ewedde eranga ulira kakati um, uh, samia hassan sihulu ye president wa tanzania eno nensonga nnyingi tujja kubalanga tubikubaganya ako mu ego ya kangwe zikalero tukwaniriza